I've, um, I've just introduced you to, uh, to the audience, but um, in your own words, I'd love you to explain to everybody what, what it is, what, what is your, what kind of, what's your day job? So I'm a marine biologist by training. Um, I did, did that as a degree um, and then sort of through the course of that, realised that research in its kind of pure form wasn't for me and that I wanted to work in conservation. So I've always been obsessed with the sea. Um, I'm from Staffordshire, nowhere near the sea at all, but it's always been a big part of my life. Um, and so I volunteered for some charities and completely fell in love with the UK marine environment. And since I graduated ooh, eight years ago, I think, um, I've been working in marine conservation. So that's my day job, protecting the sea in lots of different ways, whether that's trying to change the law, getting money to do it, getting out with kids, speaking to the minister, all, all, all part and parcel. Wow. Okay. And so um, as you rightly said, I'm based in Staffordshire as well. And we are, we are kind of, we couldn't be further away from the sea if we tried, could we? Yeah. Um, so do you, are you still based in Staffordshire doing that, that, that job? Um, most of the time I'm in Staffordshire. At the moment, I'm based up in North East England. Um, I work with lots of national organisations as well as uh, organisations that are based in different places around the coast. So I'm pretty location independent. I travel a lot for meetings, um, would like to travel less, very conscious of my carbon footprint. Um, but I, um, Staffordshire is my, is my base, yes. Well, we're looking after the carbon footprint today because we're recording this via Zoom. So we're not even yeah. in the same room, are we? No. Um, so that's it. And, and so how are things in our oceans? How, how, is, how is the marine health? Not good. Um, it's pretty dire, um, but I have hope. So I think we've definitely seen this step change in the United Kingdom in the last well, three years since we had Blue Planet on our screens. There really has been a change in public and political opinion. So a lot of the doors that I would have been banging on that were closed four years ago are now very much open. So I think there's an appetite for change. People's awareness of the fact that we have a problem is is rising and that's not just with our oceans i think that's more generally environmental awareness climate awareness is higher so that that does give me hope but actually the the state of affairs on the ground is is pretty dire well, that's a shame but also heartening as well i had um i'll reference the interview in the show notes but i had um sam coxon on um a few weeks ago and he is uh rowing uh, across the ocean and he's trying to uh, raise awareness it's part of a team but trying to raise awareness um, and raise funds for plastic soup. I think it's plastic yeah. soup foundation or plastic yeah. soup. Um, Cause it's just a huge amount of, of plastic waste in the ocean, isn't there? Yeah. Yeah. It's absolutely, it's crazy. And I think you, we're all becoming more aware of it, which is, is wonderful. And again, that, that people with power are becoming more aware of it as well. I think that that's, that's really uh, gives me great optimism, but you know, for, for people like me and, and, and Sam and, and people who spend a lot of time um, in or on the sea, you just, it's just, it's unreal. So I dive, um, I kayak, I spend a lot of time on the beach as much as I possibly can. Um, and it's just every tide brings in insane amount, insane amounts of plastic. Um, but it's what we don't see on the beach, which actually scares me more. So actually when you're, when you're diving, what you see on the seabed, what you see in the water column, you know, sometimes I'll be diving, I was in Indonesia teaching this summer and you're swimming along and something comes across your face, you panic, you think it's a jellyfish, of course it's a plastic bag. Um, and it's the tiny bits of plastic that are even more worrying. So plastic doesn't go anywhere when people say, oh, it biodegrades doesn't it just breaks up into smaller and smaller pieces and they get so tiny so we call them microplastics when they're less than five millimeters so you can either have a primary microplastic which is something that was created to be small so that's something like a nurdle so just to explain briefly there's lots of words but nurdles they're sometimes called mermaid's tears and they are the um, kind of raw material that all your plastic products are made up of so things they start life as a nurdle and then it's made into your bags your straws your bottles we have a big problem with nurdles being spilled into the sea by accident so i think it's 83 billion go into the sea in the uk alone every year um so quite often when you're walking along the strand line and you see all these what look like multicolored plastic lentils they're nurdles but you also have microplastics, which started life as something bigger. So like your Coke bottle, whatever, and it's broken down and broken down and broken down. And it's got those teeny tiny jaggedy bits of microplastic that you probably see caught in the seaweed or anything that's on the beach. Those, they're what 
a lot of animals mistake that for food to so eat that they feel full they no longer feed and so they starve to death from having too much plastic in their stomach so although plastic is unsightly it's a much greater problem a much greater threat to marine wildlife and because they're eating it it's actually getting into our food as well yeah, yeah actually that i mean just going back a little bit i didn't know there was a problem with um i've seen these little grainy things i think like oh, multicolored lentils is a really good way of, of <laughs> describing them um but i um so I, I didn't know there was firstly i didn't know there's a problem with waste of those that's that's just awful on 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 so many so many levels um but by so when it says if it says plastic is biodegradable i assumed that biodegradable meant that it would eventually become a soil like product like a compost product that's not what that means so some um there is a bit of an issue around this term biodegradable so okay. things sometimes you'll see plastic which says biodegradable on it and we see more and more of it as people try and make good choices so um small cafes or food trucks or whatever they'll be like oh i don't want to use plastic so i'll get biodegradable plastic instead but actually a lot of that plastic is only biodegradable in a commercial composter so if you pop it in the normal bin it just goes to landfill like everything else if you try and compost it at home in your compost bin it won't break down it has to go to a commercial compost facility which is where it goes under very high heat to actually break down so biodegradable plastic as it stands isn't really a, a sustainable alternative to plastic all round we're better avoiding it where we can i don't want to make plastic out to be the enemy obviously plastic has a use it has a yeah. function, but it's how we're using it that's the problem okay so i've actually got a um a hot compost bin i don't know if you know this but would that biodegrade it do you know i don't know whether it would be i hot don't know the heat or the pressure i'm not 100 percent sure it's not a lot of pressure but it is quite hot we'll have to have a look at that yeah. and, and guys if, if we yeah. find the answer we'll pop it in yeah. the the show notes because that would be quite good because actually that's a very i bought it because it's a very quick composting mm. way so but I, I don't again possibly not if it's if it's not got the um pressure then 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 maybe not but that's a concern because you would you would you know, we kind of think it's very hard, isn't it, with plastic and, uh, you know, and it, what we're part of what we're dealing with isn't necessarily what's happening now. Like you said, I think we're becoming more aware, but actually how many years have we been using plastic? I mean, I used to go to India an awful lot um, and you buy all of your plastic bottle, all of your water in plastic bottles and goodness knows what happens to them, mm. what happened to them. Yeah, I mean, plastic is... It's it's such a recent problem in <laughs> you know it's 1950s when it actually became very mainstream but yeah. you know, in our lifetimes it is just the norm um and you're right you go to the developing world and they don't have access to safe water so buying your water in a plastic bottle is your only option um a lot of our recycling actually goes to developing countries to be processed and in the past year a lot of them have stopped accepting it because we're just sending so much they can't cope with it um unfortunately recycling we're not going to be able to recycle our way out of out of this problem we need to stop that plastic at source and obviously in the uk we're really lucky that we have taps that you know nice fresh <laughs> clean water coming out yeah, just eat the tap <laughs> drink the tap water definitely <laughs> yeah <laughs> um yeah I, I think it is a real issue and i think you know i do think developing countries are becoming more of it certainly you know towards the end we we went quite a lot sort of years ago and towards the end they were definitely becoming more aware of it there was um like a, a like a money like when i was a child we used to have uh, glass pot bottles and you gave you money back on the glass bottles um and india started doing that certainly with um the you know you couldn't could only buy your water in a big sort of five gallon drum and and there was money back on that if you if you sent it back and and stuff so they were definitely becoming more aware but it's surprise it, it, it seems weird doesn't it that we 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 constantly moved away from perhaps what was a more environmental way of doing things like the glass you know money return pot bottles to that throwaway culture and now it's we're actually trying to get that back aren't we yeah so it's, it's some of the, the old ways are, are you know we're trying to go back to that so now the deposit return scheme as we're calling them now so the money back on your pot bottles um that that is coming in so the government has committed to to that there's been a consultation on what that might include um so we should know soon what what whether that will be rolled out everywhere um, and exactly what 
you know how that might work across the UK but yeah there's a lot of public support for that and I think it even if it just makes people aware of how much they're using and you can you know I think it's very easy that we don't notice so I before I became kind of more aware of my plastic um, consumption if you will I tried uh, so I just one week instead of taking my recycling out over the week I let it build up for the whole week and so it was in the kitchen so I could see what we were using it's just myself and my partner and I think we had thought of ourselves as relatively conscious making good decisions and it disgusted me what we produced over the week just two of us already thinking we were doing pretty well um and it wasn't you know I carry around my reusable bottle my water bottle I've had that for years I carry around my little reusable coffee cup so it's none of those type things but I was like oh I'm, I'm drinking pop I'm drinking my Pepsi or whatever and of course over the week that's maybe three or four bottles and actually that doesn't sound a lot over a month over a year you know it all adds up very quickly so um I think even if we just take a moment to notice what we're individually using it does it does become clear and like I say recycling is better than nothing but it's certainly not the solution we've got to try and reduce it in the first place yeah I think that's key I mean our, our recycling I'm quite proud of the fact that it's really funny that I'm quite proud of the fact that my recycling bin is fuller than my normal bin but actually yeah that's still waste isn't it it's still waste that that we wouldn't wouldn't necessarily necessarily need to do and I find it quite um I find it quite difficult from a from a food point of view I'm very um I buy lots of, of my sort of fruit and veg locally so mm. it, um and, I, and lots of the farm shops have, have turned to paper bags or like if I buy from the market I'll just give them a big bag and they'll, they'll fill it up as they as they're going along um and in the supermarkets I'll always buy loose products but uh, you know I think meat and fish products is it, quite an issue for people because uh, they are often in Sydney in the supermarkets they're often packed up already aren't they mm. It is tough with with meat and fish. I mean, there are some supermarkets that will let you take your own container. So if you buy them from the counter, you know, the meat counter or the um, the fish counter, then they will let you put it in to your own Tupperware. So you don't have to use, um, you know, that kind of prepackaging. But unfortunately, the meat and fish from the counter are for more expensive than the pre-packaged stuff so if you're in a you're you know if you're lucky enough to be in a position where you can make those good choices then then wonderful but for a lot of people that's you know that it's not their only driver but being uh making good eco-conscious decisions it's that's you know in an ideal world that would be your only driver but of course people have different you know different needs some months i certainly couldn't afford to do that and etc so i think there has got to be something coming in from the supermarkets themselves on this in that why is that so much more expensive and it's the same with vegetables if you go to the supermarket your pre-packaged pack of six of whatever fruit or vegetable is undoubtedly a lot cheaper than buying six individual items of those and putting them in your own bag so you know it is stacked against us but we can only ever make the best choices we can make i think exactly and it's madness isn't it? i do think the fruit and vegetables is absolute madness but um just from a nutrition point of view because obviously that's that's my field what i would mm. say to people is is that i would encourage people to buy um less volume and better quality mm. because nutritionally um particularly when we're talking about um meat or fish if you buy you know organic grass-fed beef or if you're buying wild salmon for example that actually has um a higher nutritional value and certainly with like salmon more omega-3s which is what we're all looking for so from a nutritional point of view i would rather people have less and just have a better small amount and i know it's more expensive but actually if you then if you have your budget and buy the volume that you can afford for your budget rather than um, say well like, you know I need fish and this is what we're going to do I would rather people have half a fillet each let's say uh, of better quality um, because actually from a nutritional point of view you know obviously environmentally I'm bothered but from a nutritional point of view they're actually getting more nutrients they are more nutrient dense than farm salmon which isn't doesn't swim does it so it hasn't got much muscle has it no, I mean, farm salmon is, I don't eat farm salmon. I wouldn't eat farm salmon for, for very much from an environmental perspective. Yeah. It's not something I would, I would want to eat. I know uh, what, how, they, how they are raised. Um, but I, I completely agree. And I think that it kind of touches on the issue, doesn't it? We're so used to 
just it's cheap we buy lots it goes off in the fridge and we chuck it away and we have you know we eat a small amount of it whereas actually if we just were much more conscious with our purchases then you're choosing something you actually want you buy as much as you actually need and then you're much more likely to eat it so uh, one of the biggest environmental issues is food waste because if you've bought it it sits in the fridge and then goes in the bin it's not benefiting anybody it's just a cost isn't it yeah so i completely agree if you're making that conscious decision you're like oh i'm going to spend a little bit more on this good fish good meat good vegetable whatever um you're much more likely to actually cook it into something than letting it just oh yeah oops in the bin yeah to- totally yeah yeah how many times do we buy the same vegetables every single week put them in our put them in our basket with no thought about what mm. we're actually going to make with that and then you know we all find that bag of soggy salad that's at the bottom of the drawer going oh gosh yeah i forgot that was there and you know goes in the bin doesn't it um i'm, I'm really interested to find about the um the children that work with a, a colleague of mine um was uh, was talking about um he, he's got um a, a an energy company an energy supply company and he's um approaching schools to to um try and educate because he works a lot with schools and um he said it's surprising how much energy they use when they're not actually there mm. um, and this is a big, big issue and he's helping them with energy saving which sounds uh, counter, you know, counterintuitive because he's he's charging them for energy, but he would rather them, you know, use less and pay less. Um, and they're in, they're um, encouraging the children to be more aware of the energy they're using. And he said it's absolutely brilliant to to get into children quite young, and they are quite they're quite receptive. And I suppose it is from you know what's going on um, in the press and stuff at the minute. So are you are you finding that schools and school children are becoming more aware and more receptive to 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 being educated it's, it's a difficult one i think oh. kids are always receptive but they it's where they get in their information so i think um you, we are seeing more instances of kids whose parents have sat them down and watched something like blue planet or they watch you know the the amazing kids documentaries that are available on tv and the kids that are being exposed to that information they're the ones who are writing in and going i've saved up my pocket money and i'd like you to use this to help save the dolphins you know little legends that they are but then there's a lot of children that unfortunately aren't being exposed to that information um a lot of my work is um kind of designing projects that gets school children out onto the coast around the UK so they're exposed to the amazing wildlife that we have because as a general rule children adults alike people just don't think there's much in our sea at all they think it's grey and lifeless it's dull and couldn't be farther from the truth but for a lot of children particularly well even from coastal communities the time that I take them down to the beach might very well be the first time that they've ever been wow. so I had a group um Oh, a couple of months ago they lived all of them within walking distance of the beach and none of them had been in a fun capacity you know they'd never been rock pooling they'd never been to play and it's very you know it's literally walkable and free and I think because of that because there's no grounding in the fact that what we have is worth protecting there isn't then that desire to change your behavior to look after it so there's still, I think, a lot of perception that we want to save things that are far away. We want to, you know, yes, we'll stop using plastic and maybe we'll think about what we're eating. But there's never that, oh, actually, what I do here impacts what we have here because people aren't really thinking that there's anything worth protecting wildlife wise in the UK. Um, and I think as soon as children have that information, oh, they're away and they want to protect it and they want to do, change their behaviour and they go home and, you know, they report back that we're using reusable bags or, you know, we've raised some money at school, we had a bake sale, whatever. It's amazing, you know, that passion. And I wish that stayed with them their whole lives. But it is them getting that information in the first place. And unfortunately, a lot of young people still aren't aren't getting that gosh that's a shame but at least well you're doing what you can but that's I can't believe that that um, kids who live so close but I suppose it's when it's well we both live in Staffordshire so I have to say I was a little bit like that about Cannock Chase which is mm. just down the road from me and then you kind of I think for me I got a little bit older and then was like you know what this is really beautiful we, we really need to to, to take take care of it and you know maybe maybe it's the same the same with you because we, we do have an amazing um history of 
a, a food from the, from the oceans, don't we? We have a very rich, I'm trying to think of the, the right terminology, but we have, there's a lot of, there's a lot of food in our local ocean, isn't there? <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. And, you know, it's a big part of our heritage as well, you know, so the food that we um, historically ate, the seafood that we ate, obviously came from our waters, yeah. you know, Ships went far, shot far, have always gone a long way. Um, but, you know, there very much was that you ate what was there. I think there's a, obviously that seasonality. People don't think of there being seasons in the sea, but there absolutely are. Um, so, you know, that very much defined the diet of, you know, way back when we were you know, hunter-gatherers to when there was the fishing communities to when, you know, now we have so much choice we no longer have to stick to what's available because everything's available all the time and as a result some of that that knowledge and heritage has has not been lost but it's not at the kind of tip of everybody's tongues in the same way Um, and that's a real shame because there is such a richness in our seas I mean it has been over exploited um, same around the world so um, I've got some figures. I think it's ninety. Yeah, ninety percent of the world's fish stocks are fully or overexploited, and that's very much the case for close to home as well. Um, but there are good choices that people can make. But it's not just about the food. It's the fact that you know it's come locally. It's somebody's job. It's part of of who we are. You know, we're an island nation. We're a very maritime culture, and and I think it's sad that that connection to the sea through what we eat has been lost. Um, not not across the board but for, for a lot of us I think particularly if you're from the Midlands and it's perhaps not as big a part of our our culture yeah I agree I mean you know oysters I think is a, it's a perfect example we have the, some of the best oysters and you know years ago you, you know it was it was actually a peasant food wasn't it mm. and now it you know it's been elevated but things like from you know from a from a, a again from a nutrition and a health point of view you know um a sort of mackerel and sardines and things we have great in this country and actually a lot of them are shipped abroad because we, we don't eat them anymore so all those beautiful smoke houses that we used to have years ago are going 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 out, out of business because we, we're not we're not eating them yeah we're very limited in the uk in, in what we what we our fish habits i suppose in what we yeah. choose to eat. so pretty much the big five we eat a lot of cod haddock tuna salmon and prawns that's for a lot of people what their their fish is made up of and, and your know, fish fingers non you know <laughs> unidentified white fish in butter so a lot of people is you know that's what fish is or fish from the fish and chip shop um but we do have like you say have such such rich seas and, and you know things like like your herring your mackerel um you know schooling fish like that they are they're a really good option across the board you know they're sustainable in most guises um they low carbon footprint because they're big schools of fish so it takes very little energy to scoop them all up you know rather than having to go a long way to catch them um and they're really good for you as well um and pretty versatile as a fish for what you can can turn them into as a meal so um we are i think we are missing a lot of opportunity um nutritionally but also you know from good tasty food perspective on, on what's on our doorstep and obviously the best thing we can do is eat local so that counts for fish as well totally i couldn't agree more couldn't agree more and yeah exactly you know i think it's we've, we've become quite bland and quite rigid in our diets i talk to people about this a lot because i'm you know i'm a big believer in seasonal eating and like you said you know fish is very seasonal um crabs in season at the moment isn't it which i love yeah. <laughs> and um and but we've become very um kind of very habitual um and so we don't you know we don't live by the the seasons in the same way and and I I find it quite sad and I you know I'm a a big advocate for that so you 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 talked briefly and we'll try and bring it back a little bit to the food and stuff so you talked briefly about the the schooling the school fish so so that's mackerel and sardines yeah um anchovies do we have anchovies in the UK um the Anchovy, lots of things will be branded as anchovy. They're not necessarily anchovy. Ah. Um, so there's a really good website that I will absolutely guide anybody to go to. It's, if you Google a good fish guide, it has all of the information and it tells you if it's in season, it tells you if it's sustainable, it tells you which stock to get it from. 
and it's um it's the marine conservation society run it so i would absolutely advise anybody who wants that information on fish it is a one-stop shop for for information um and it's you can either go online or you can get it as an app on your phone as well so when you're in the wow. supermarket you can literally tap and have a look and see whether the thing you're looking at on the shelf is is sustainable and in season and something you want to buy um, that's brilliant we'll put a link to that in the show notes yeah. definitely that's absolutely amazing i didn't know they did that so um is it like um, I'll, I'll be honest i'm going to fess up a little bit here <laughs> is um i don't eat a lot of fish um i tend to eat fish when i'm out and the, the main reason for that is my husband doesn't doesn't eat fish he's just he's literally had cod for the first time a couple of months ago he's had it twice and prior to that, he just wouldn't eat fish. He didn't like the taste of it, but he realizes it's good for him. So we've gone for a very plain, basic white fish uh, wrapped in ham <laughs> okay. um, <laughs> to try and get him into the fish thing. So I don't actually cook fish at home. So, um, so I don't buy it is, is where I'm going with this. And so um, in, we'll, we'll talk about um, sort of proper fish merchants in a little while, but if someone was just going to the supermarket, like, um, most of people do um when you i always encourage people when they're buying vegetables to have a look to see where the country of origin is you know because how many times do we have something that's could be grown in the uk and it's been shipped 100 miles and it doesn't need to be does uh, does fish labeling do the same thing does it tell you where it's come from yes so um there's eu legislation that says it has to be on all of our fish so it will say if you go to the supermarket it will say the country where it was caught um and it will also give some information sometimes it will give information about how it was caught as well um, and that's kind of the information that you'll want to look at from a sustainability point of view but on that um, app and the details that will be in the show notes that that will help point you in you know it's a bit of a quagmire you know you'll see things hand line pollen line diver caught you know so per se um so to kind of get your head around all of those terms which might be on the tin it might be on the on the packet um then you know you can understand a little bit more about what they mean but there's another thing you can look at when you go in the supermarket which um there's like a little blue logo and it will say marine stewardship council and that means it's certified as sustainable so as a first glance if you're just sort of starting out that is something to look at and, and lots of our supermarkets do stock fish that's from sustainably um harvested sources so they will have that msc logo on a lot of their products Fantastic. And would that, um, does sustainable apply to farmed as well? So do we need to be aware of that? Can, can farmed yeah, fish so be sustainable? It can be. Um, so there's a different logo for, um, for farmed, but it, it's, it's really clear. It will ha- if it has no logo, try and avoid it. If it has the, the Marine Stewardship Council, um, they do certify some farmed fish, I believe. Um, but there is another logo. Um, I can't remember what it says. It's, um, it's, but it, it, it will be clear when it will say like sustainably farmed and the same with organic. So you can get organic farmed fish as well. So that's something to think about from a, um, you know, if you want to make better choices, but obviously that's slightly more expensive than your non-organically farmed um, fish. Same for salmon. You can get organic farmed salmon. Oh, that's good. Cause I think we need to be aware of that because I think people are very aware of like say eggs, for, for example, people are very aware of how awful the conditions were for battery hens and you know i i personally don't know anybody who wouldn't look at the label now and make sure it wasn't you know it was at least you know sort of a barn raised but actually i i go for you know as, as good quality as you can get in fact i try and buy mine from the farm shop where i can see the chickens roaming around nearby but i think we've become aware of that but i think people are much less aware particularly how heavily farmed salmon can be and in and what poor conditions they're in and i think you know for me that's a really key thing to say to people is you know that they need to really think think about that when they're when they're buying it because the the quality well never mind the you know the 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 issues with the you know the quality of life of the fish but actually the quality of the produce is is not good either is it and we need to you know push people away from that you know hard as we can yeah i mean i i i think we're um a lot of people think that farmed fish is more sustainable than wild caught fish and actually for something like salmon so salmon is a carnivore kind of so it eats meat so they have to feed it meat and often that food that it's fed is wild caught fish so they catch fish in the wild to then feed to the farmed salmon um so about 20 million tons of wild caught fish is for fish food every year um so that just goes to feed the salmon obviously it's not a very energy 
effective, efficient yeah. way of raising Good anything. Um, and then the same with salmon, farm salmon, there is a damage to the environment. So you get these dead zones beneath the, the fish farms. There's a problem with something called sea lice. So they have literally lice that live on the fish. So to get rid of them, they use lots of different like antibiotics and things to because there's there's if, well that's more about the infection but the sea lice sometimes they take wild caught fish that eat the sea lice they put the wild caught fish in with the salmon to eat the sea lice so it's not from a sustainability point of view a perfect system um there are better and there are worse types of farm salmon and that's reflected in how much it costs so obviously if you um if it's a very cheap farm salmon it's definitely not something i would choose to eat um there are cases where it's been found they do dye the salmon so it looks uh pinker you know they choose the color than than it naturally would be um so for me personally farm salmon isn't something that i i would personally choose to put in my body no no me and i think from a for a toxin point of view like i said you know i'm I think we're becoming more aware of, of eating meat that has have hormones in it and, and have antibiotics. There's been some research um, fairly recently. There's talk um, kind of in the nutrition and naturopathy world of, about the fact that um, our um, resistance to antibiotics may not just be down to how many antibiotics we're having ourselves um, as a course of antibiotics, but also by what we're what we're eating. Um, and so, you know, there's lots of talk about meat, but I think it's really important that actually, you know, if we're eating fish, that is flesh in the same way. Um, and, you know, it's a living thing. And if they're ingesting antibiotics or whatever else might be that they're, that they're having, we, you know, as part of that food chain, are going to be taking that in ourselves, aren't we? And mm -hmm. it's something that we, you know, we need to really think about. We need to be respectful, I think, of the products that we're putting into our body because that's what's feeding us and that's what we're going to be you know consuming as part of that food chain yeah i completely agree and i think something that is it's always been my viewpoint on this is that we call them meat and fish but fish is meat in exactly the same way that meat from a cow is meat you know it's yes. still the flesh of an animal we call it a different word we don't really think about it because it hasn't got fur or feathers or big eyes a lot of our fish do have big eyes but you know it is it is it is meat in exactly the same way and I think a lot of people choose it because they're like oh I want to cut the amount of meat in my diet so I'll eat more fish a lot of the issues do do pervade um in the same way and you know from a from a carbon footprint perspective fish is slightly better than a lot of meat not all meat you know locally caught meat has a lower carbon footprint uh, locally reared meat has a lower carbon footprint but it's exactly the same for fish you know some some fish has a very low carbon footprint some has a very high carbon footprint because you think you've got to put fuel in a boat which goes and spends a long time at sea to catch fish it's then brought back it's processed a lot of our fish is caught transported halfway across the world for processing and then flown back so oh, you know, the carbon footprint of fish is not it's not a, a be all you know catch all if you excuse the pun so i think as always locally better if you can local seasonal sustainably harvested whether that's meat or fish yeah totally and even living in in the midlands we can still get you know sort of um good quality fish that has been that has been um caught well if you like from small fisheries and things and it, it, you know, it's like going to the farm shop you know you can there's, there's a couple of, of of really nice um sort of fish counters uh, locally and i know they get they get their fish uh, direct from smaller um uh, fisheries um and it, that's what you want isn't it? it's that connection it's it's understanding yeah. you know they are at, at, at the end of the day they are farmers of the sea in a way and they know what the best conditions are the best way to catch the fish what you know when to catch them and i think that's what we need we need to understand isn't it yeah so i mean in the uk you're never more than i think it's 70 miles from the sea so in you know in, the, in terms of the world it's not Although we think of ourselves as being very landlocked in, in Staffordshire, it's not that far. It's not that bad, um, is it? No. <laughs> but, you know, I certainly wouldn't want to discourage people from eating fish. It's just being more conscious about it. And, you know, absolutely that caught by, you know, small boats, you know, very much more sustainable in their methods than these huge super trawlers that we have. Um, and, you know, that if you can see that supply chain, you know, it's come locally caught, it's gone to you know the, the the fish market and it's come to your fishmonger in in you know there's very few kind of cogs in that chain 
absolutely go for it and and just but do ask those questions of your local fishmonger you know wherever you are in in the country in the world you know wh where has this come from how is it caught what species is it you know ask that information and if they don't know it then just gently encourage them that maybe they should know a little bit more about the provenance of of the fish that they're stocking totally and understanding that like we we we, we kind of um talked very we briefly mentioned that kind of like fish finger that you know nondescript white fish covered in in batter or <laughs> <Yeah>. breadcrumbs <laughs> that you know that you know we have we have all eaten at some at some point in time and it's understanding that so we talked about um things like kind of mackerel sardines and you know the kind of the schools of fish um and then but things like cod i don't think people realize how big um like a fish like a cod is a the they're big fish aren't they i mean they're still big i mean they were once huge you know where they're getting smaller and smaller as we overfish but you know yeah they are they're not the little fish that we think of you know sort yeah, of you don't eat a whole cod do you it's not a whole <laughs> cod in batter from this from yeah. the... <laughs> and it's the same as a tuna you know a tuna is a huge animal yeah. um and no and, and a salmon's a bit you know they're, again they're big fish yeah, they're big, but, yeah. um i think the thing with with your, your sort of cods and, and haddocks they you know they quite often I'm very disappointed when I have when I have them you know you sometimes get a beautiful bit of cod but quite often it's a bit tasteless and there are some some delicious other white fishes that are on the market that are far um you know far less threatened cod has been managed much better in the last decade but you know things like coley um your whitings you know depending on the source of it I mean all this information is available on the good fish guide but I can't personally detect a huge taste difference often it tastes better um and you know it's often cheaper too well they are aren't they considerably uh, you know i do remember that uh, coley and whiting um certainly if i go to our fish counter it, um then it, you know there's a considerable sort of price difference and if they put them next to each other i wouldn't i would not be able um to tell the difference um and I'm sure the taste of the, you know, the taste the same. Are they, are they more sustainable? Because we've got things like sea bass as well now, aren't we? And that, that suddenly became a, you know, like the trendy fish to have. So is it, is it down to um, supply and demand effectively that people keep asking for cod and, and sea bass? And that's why the, 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 uh, the issue is with, with sustainability with those fish. Does that make sense? Yeah. I mean, there is, there, there's definitely a demand factor, you know, so I think, as we talked about we're quite uh, set in our ways we like cod and you know we, we you know, that's it we're not interested in anything else and they've yeah. done all these blind taste tests and people are like oh that one's nice and it's not cod but yeah. you know like remember Hughes fish bite did some amazing um amazing work to kind of push our our boundaries a little bit and what we would you know we'd actually have pollock for example instead of yeah. cod yeah but, you know and um so that, i mean there's a demand factor some fish are more um susceptible to um you know kind of they're more vulnerable like they they as a species if they're slower growing or you know certain things about how they live their lives mean that they are um will feel the pressure of fishing much quicker than other species some species will bounce back more than others and that's all taken into account when fish are given their sustainability rating um but i think i guess my take-home message this can all feel very overwhelming but it is just not being afraid of trying different fish you know give it a go look you know have a look on the on the app have a look speak to your fishmonger and try something you never know you might you might like it more than the thing that you were having before um and if that has got you know if it is more sustainable and you enjoy it more then it's a win-win yeah totally totally um and so for kind of like just for my own reference so if we say for example if i know i know there's um an issue around catching lot you know having to catch larger fish so a cod has to be a certain size before you can catch it and things like that but how old how old are they generally like so are they this similar to like so cod and, and whiting would they be um uh, or coley or would they be a similar age when they're caught how 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 old is a piece of is, is a fish when it, it's generally it, caught it's that's how long is a piece of string like every okay <laughs> a different rate, but no absolutely like some of some of those big cod like they're older than me you know they are wow. <laughs> you know so they you know they, they live a long time a lot of different fish live live different lengths of time and i think that for me something to, you know, again that fish are fish and meat is meat but you know fish are animals too and, and they have really interesting diverse life histories they are you know fascinating animals in their own right they're not just a bit of food um and i think 
I'm not, it's not to put people off eating them, but it's just to maybe appreciate them a little bit more for what you're having in the same way as you would appreciate the fact that what you're eating when you're eating pork was a pig, for example. To, I totally agree. I didn't realise cod could be that old. And that, you know, you have to respect that, don't you, really, that, you know, you're not eating. I, I think in people's mind, I, I don't know if we just suddenly think that a fish, like, it's a couple of months and then it's done almost. It's, mm-hmm. But actually, if it's lived, you know, a long time, then yeah that it's traveled around it's you know it it is it is an animal isn't it it's just a yeah. water animal rather yeah. than a, a a land animal that's fascinating i could talk to you for hours i really could but i'm <laughs> <laughs> i'm keen I, you know i'm hoping people don't think that we've been too too hardcore on this but because it's I, I found it a really interesting subject so i really wanted to ask more questions and um i know uh, you know sort of um uh, the, the health of the, the the oceans is really important so um is there can you give us a, a few um takeaways for things that we can easily easily do that would have um you know the most impact yes absolutely so kind of the top three uh, the, the absolute number one thing that we can each do that will have the biggest impact on the oceans is to reduce our carbon footprint i don't want to sound like a broken record on this but it really is the biggest threat to our oceans you know far more significant than even plastic um so you know every little bit that you can do even if you just make small changes over time they do add up i'm not saying give up flying you know but just just think about what you can personally do and remember your food has a carbon footprint as well so just think about that when you're doing your shopping um second one is thinking about plastic 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 i know it's pushed down our throats but there is something you know we can all make those small changes you can start with your water bottle and your coffee cup but you know as we've talked about if you're going for that better produce you're going to your fishmonger you're going to be able to take your tupperware box if you are going and buying your vegetables from a green grocer, you can take your own bag so there is a bit of a win-win from a nutritional and food standards perspective and how that's helping obviously our farmers and local fishers as well as the plastics so you know hopefully that's an easy win for people um and then another one is just to kind of think about the other types of pollution that we create so could you use more eco-friendly washing powder for example could you use um you know the, the shampoo that you use the body wash that you use just thinking about those because every drain in some guise or another does lead to the sea so what we put down our drains particularly if you ever pour anything in the drains in the streets so when you're washing your car just have a think about that because they quite often will go to rivers so just thinking about our own little impact and the small changes that we can make because they do add up there's a lot of us on the planet so it's not about us all doing it perfectly it's about us all making little changes um because they do they will add up totally couldn't agree more and for me for the your third point about you know thinking about toxins from a from a health perspective you know that's vital as well and so you know this is this is a win 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 all round i'm a huge advocate of of using uh, natural products um i've massively reduced the amount of toxins that we use in, in our home um, and we still have a very clean house mm. <laughs> and clean people <laughs> so you don't need to use chemicals and like you said it ends up in the oceans and and we don't want that and actually ends up back in our drinking water in, in, in some ways as well which is which is an issue and if we're encouraging people to drink more tap water then we need to be mindful about what we're putting down the sink really don't we um there's uh, there's an app that i will put um a link to in the show notes um where local um shops will uh refill your water bottle for you as well so i think that's really important because that encourages people to carry their water bottles around with them as well absolutely i i use that the refill app and yes. i have never once been turned away I've literally ne- never once. Everybody has always been more than happy. Even even places that don't have the logo in the window, I've never been turned away. So don't be scared of asking people to fill your water bottle. Totally, and it's kind of it. It builds a bit of community as well, doesn't it? I quite like the fact that you you might go into a shop that you wouldn't have normally gone into, and and you have a chat. It you know opens up a conversation, doesn't it? Generally, yeah. quite often I buy something as well. You know, yes, win <laughs> <laughs> <So it> win. <laughs> Uh, brilliant and we purposefully uh, we've purposely re- recorded this it's a very very wet miserable December but it's November very wet and miserable end of November and we purposely recorded this so that we could release it before Christmas because I think people um, Christmas time is definitely a time when people tend to well, let's say push the boat out a little bit more and then and they might be buying fish products that they they wouldn't necessarily buy it's a time of year when we tend to treat ourselves um, and so 
Um, have you got some tips for, for, you know, you've already shared lots of tips. I love those labels. That's very easy. You know, people can, you know, can see that without having to, you know, having to think too much. Are there any other tips that you could give people on, you know, alternatives to what they might have normally or, um, you know, the best way to shop sustainably for, for fish to protect our future? So I think for um, shopping sustainably, we've touched on most of it, but it's um, thinking about whether, you know, where the fish has come from what species it is, how it's been caught, all of that information is really easily available. Um, taking your own um, pot, you know, your own Tupperware yeah. when you get it because that's, you know, an easy win. Um, but on, on that good fish guide that I um, keep talking about, <laughs> I promise mm-hmm. I don't get permission, but <laughs> they, um, there are some really awesome recipe ideas on there. So if there are, you know, new fish that you're thinking, oh, I'd quite like to try that, but I'm not really sure what I would do with it. There are some recipe ideas to, set, to get you going. Um, and I think some of the easy ones to, to change out your cod and haddock, swap it for coli, your salmon, you can swap it for rainbow trout. You probably won't notice too much of a difference depending on how you cook it um, or, or what you use it for. Uh, things like tuna, um, when you when you go into the supermarket, if it says on it pole and line caught, that's much better than the ones that are caught using a big net. Um, and then if it's a skipjack tuna, that's much better than the other species of tunas because that's much faster growing and it's much less susceptible to overfishing. So they're pretty easy swaps that you can make um, in the run up to Christmas and beyond. And then just at Christmas, thinking about, you know, food waste is a big issue at Christmas. We often overbuy, just trying to be a little bit more conscious. I know it's hard and I certainly not anywhere near perfect but you know just do try and make those effort year on year um and then in terms of just thinking about your waste as well so you know could you there's nothing better than giving your time and giving something you've made so could you make something like jam or chutney or cakes or bread or biscuits as a present i did it a few years ago and and honestly people still talk about it uh, for good reasons not (laughs) 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 exactly it was me giving my time to bake them and then give them. And actually that went down a lot better than the same old boring smelly kits that I would have bought normally. So um, if you can think about stuff like that, if you, if you are able, then that would be a great start. That's fantastic. That, that's, that's really useful. And, and yeah, I think the thing the thing that I've picked up on that is, um, is like now my husband has finally decided that he'd like to try fish <laughs> um, is to, I'm going to go on the website and I'm going to have a look and I'm, I'm going to, google a few recipes and so uh, as part of our membership site i uh, i release recipes every week so um i'll um, i'll have a bit of a play with those we might we might have a, a fish month or something so uh an, an fish alternative month would be would be a good one so we'll we'll look at that and see where it fits seasonally in the calendar but i think that'd be quite good fun actually um so that that'd be really good but that's brilliant that's really good and um just as a bit of an aside you would i i loved that um you know make your own christmas gifts and and give time that's lovely um and there are lots of beach cleanup operations aren't there if people are interested in helping out if they do live closer to the ocean uh, closer to the sea um they can help out by clean cleaning up the beaches can't they absolutely so uh, if you go on to um the marine conservation society website so that's the same website that hosts the good fish guide but i'll include a, a link to both bits of it um, they have um, a really awesome program of beach clean so you just type in your postcode and they'll tell you where the nearest next beach clean is happening they have some big events around the year but you can either join um, an organized beach clean um, or of course you can you can do your own sort of two minute beach clean if you're down on the beach and you just want to pick up some some rubbish yourself lots of places have um, two minute beach clean boards which is where it's just like an a-frame board some litter pickers bags you go and do your own little beach clean and then bring the stuff back and then pop the the rubbish in the bin um and if if we all do that it all adds up so you know you can join an organized one or go out and do it yourself but obviously just if you're out doing it yourself be careful of things like needles and dog poo and that kind of thing just just be careful especially if you've got children but um for the most part it's I've, i've never had an issue with with safety but just to be aware of that's great and i think i think the key takeaway from this is every little thing that you do every little thing helps doesn't it yeah, absolutely. It adds up, you know, seven billion of us, you know, if we all all made a small change, it would add up pretty quickly. Wouldn't it just, wouldn't it just. Thank you so much, Emily. We'll put all the links in the show notes. Uh, can people find you on, on social media channels as well? Or is there any way you'd like to sort of direct people to, to become more involved? 
Absolutely. So I am on Facebook as Marine Biology Life. Same on Instagram, Marine Biology Life. You can find me on Twitter as eg underscore Cunningham. Um, happy to hear from anybody. Would love to know what you thought. And if you've got any questions or would like some advice, then I'm always happy to help point people in the right direction. Fabulous. That's been brilliant. Thank you so much. I really could. Literally, I, I could I could sit here for hours and chat to you, but we will have to wrap it up. But <laughs> thank you. It's been brilliant. And lots of takeaways. Uh, I'll put all the links in the show notes. But thanks, Emily. It's been lovely talking to you. Thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure. Yeah, exactly.